Now, despite the fact that somebody left during that, this is not the best your life can be. It can get even better. Because we're about to talk about thermal expansion. All right, how about before we jump into thermal expansion, because I know all of you are really excited about that, let's take a break, stretch your legs, we'll come back, thermal expansion. And one of those really an anecdote about a really bad job interview. Um, so I was a sophomore in college, studying engineering, and went through the round of summer jobs. And I was in one job, and it came up about the Expansion, how much does uh, material expand given the energy that you put into it, how much will it expand? And I did what I usually do in those situations, is I tried to go off my memory as opposed to thinking. But you will do better, because presumably you haven't seen the equation before, so you will have to think. What I know, want to know is, if I put energy into it, it's going to heat up. If I take energy out, it will cool off. But what will the change in length depend upon? It does. And so that is bundled up in this the thermal coefficient, sorry, thermal expansion coefficient, represented by an alpha. Thermal expansion coefficient. Make sure I wrote alpha down somewhere. I'll just look it up if we have to. All right, what else will it depend on? Yes. And I will say the one that we haven't said yet is the one that I could not think of. And matter of fact, to, to try to help me out, he said, can you think of the units of the coefficient? No. I did not get that summer job, probably for other reasons too. But what's there's one more one more factor. That's the one that I could. How much it expands does depend on how long it is to start with. If you get to buy something that's five centimeters long, it's probably not going to increase by five, another five centimeters. Mm -hmm. Buy something a mile long, having it increase by five centimeters, much more realistic. One more shot to try to find alpha. All I have is the equation and not the actual value for alpha, fortunately. Internet exists. Thermal. Unfortunately, I can't find thermal coefficient. of linear expansion. All right, so for aluminum, point zero 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 two five. make sure I get the right units down. Per degree Celsius. So no units on top, just on the bottom. So I have my piece of aluminum. And we'll say it is five meters long. 
I put a fire underneath it to get that thing heated up. And it goes from room temperature to let's say 110 degrees Celsius. How much will that aluminum bar expand? Plug and jump. Alpha is a constant, it's given to you, it is material dependent. Somebody has gone through and done the fancy calculate, uh, fancy experiments to come up with a number. It is not a theoretical number at all, it's done by experiment. So when I change the length, the point zero, 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 oh, wait a second. Okay, second, I think it was gonna be off at zero there. Two, five. Per degree Celsius times my original length, five meters, times the change of temperature, which is nine degrees. And if someone would be kind enough to do that on a calculator. So this five meter long bar, which would be, I guess from the wall to somewhere around here, is going to expand a little more than one centimeter. It's not much for aluminum, but it could be just enough, depending on if you're designing a bridge or whatnot. If you cross over bridges and you see that on the road, you get the road here, and then you'll You'll see a piece of metal like that, and then another piece of metal like this. And then underneath it, you've got a, a support beam. I'm hoping you can visualize what I'm talking about here. And this is to allow for expansion and, and shrinkage. That when it's cold, these little things will separate because the concrete also will expand or contract. The will separate and you get a wider gap there. And then during the summer or the hotter months, they will come closer to each other. Hopefully it's not tight in the winter time because the tight in the winter time, the summer comes along, it's going to try to expand and basically what's going to happen is roads will start to buckle. And there's a nice picture in the book where, I think it's in this textbook, where he shows a road that was not designed properly and basically you get these points in the road where it suddenly puffs out. So, in order to expand this five meter long bar, that extra 1.125 centimeters, how much energy did it take? What would you figure out? What would you use to figure out how much energy it takes to do that? I know you're all thinking the correct answer, and you're just afraid to that you will not be in unison if you all speak at once. Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. Uh, that is a long way of going about it. Q could be measured. How would you figure out how much energy it takes to actually get those bars to expand that 1.125 centimeters? Pardon? No, uh, no, I don't have energy in that problem yet. I mean, that's checking the work would only confirm that final number there. Could it just do the the equation we were just using? Absolutely. The amount of energy related to the amount of temperature, right there. All right. So the amount of mass. Uh, I guess I get, need to give a couple other dimensions here. So it's five meters long, and uh, let's make it a 
0.1 meter by 0.1 meter by 5 meter long bar. So basically 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 5 meters. So what's the volume? How do I find the volume? Say it again, Tana. It's time to work time part. Yeah. So you just multiply together. So my volume is point oh five. Oh five. It's just one two. One two. Yes. Thank you. Cubic meters. So I have the volume now, but I don't have the mass. So how would I find the mass of this aluminum bar if I know the volume? Asking you to pull, to draw back on things that you have done in other courses about the relationship between mass and volume. We talked about it briefly here. us the relationship between mass and volume of a substance. Density. Yes. Density. Symbolized by the letter rho is mass divided by volume. So all we need to know is the density of aluminum. 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter or 2,700 kilograms per cubic meter. Again, yeah, not something that I'm expecting you to have memorized, but aluminum we've used enough in other labs and courses that I have to do that one. So my density, my 2,700 kilogram per cubic meter is equal to my mass which is what I'm trying to find, divided by my volume, 0 0.05 cubic meters. Now, unfortunately, this M stands for meters, this M, M stands for meters, and this M stands for mass. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, instead of using a lowercase M there, I'm gonna use an uppercase M just to differentiate it from the others. So what is the mass of my aluminum block? math problem we're working right there is 2700 is equal to the unknown divided by 0 0.05. That's the math problem. So I have a 135 kilogram block, so that is going to be roughly just shy of 300 pounds. That's a big old piece of aluminum. Well, it's five meters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So we can now plug into our equation here. Uh, actually, no, this equation over here. I have 135 kilograms times my specific heat, which I know is 0.215 calories per gram degree Celsius times my change in temperature, which we figured out was 90 
degrees Celsius. What issue are we going to run into? Yes. So which one do you want to convert? All right. What is a kilogram anyway? In terms of grams? A thousand. Yeah. Kilo means a thousand. So I could just take that K out right there and stick and just tack on the three zeros. There we go. Now we've got the math problem we can work with here. And we end up with the number of calories. Someone's going to tell me this absolutely spectacular answer. It's like 2,612,250. Is that what you said? I throw the units on at the end. Basically, the amount of, I, I think I said I wasn't going to bring it up again, or at least I thought it, but I'll do it anyway. That's basically the number of food calories that you need per day. There's a lot of energy stored in food, and actually anything with matter, there's a lot of energy there. Just, it, we just don't have a way of really harnessing it without burning it. And not much gets converted when you burn it. Questions to hear? Phase change, then take you through the just the laws of thermodynamics, and then we'll be done. Uh, I will say that uh, yeah, laws of thermodynamics is it ends on a depressing note, so I apologize right now. So after one of the one of those classes where I went over the second law of thermodynamics, which is particularly, particularly depressing, I assume. So, well, I know you're not right. Is this stuff going to be on the next test? It's fair game. Again, the bulk of it is not this. Phase change. Use water as an example. Not a proper title. Degree Celsius, so zero and one hundred. So freezing point of water, boiling point of water. So if I have ice, so if I have uh, water down here, it's ice. And basically, as I pump heat into ice, I'm, I'm going to increase the temperature. It doesn't melt instantly. I have to get it up to melting point. So as I put in, heat into it, it's going to. I need to get it up to the melting point. Once I get it to the melting point, I actually have to melt it. And that requires energy. It does not change the temperature as I melt it. It just changes the phase. Then I pump energy into it in order to change the temperature again. I get it to the boiling point, and I need to change the phase first before I increase the temperature again. So as I put energy into it, when I, the phase change, I'm not changing temperature at all. So for this right here, we have the amount of energy is equal to mc delta t. This would be the specific, uh, specific heat of ice. This would be mc delta t. That's the specific heat of liquid water. And then here, mc delta t. This is all the amount of heat energy you can put in to change the temperature, and this is for vapor.
Oh, the difference between vaporizing and boiling is that boiling is specifically you're changing something from a liquid to a gas through temperature means. Vaporization is that the molecule happens to hit the right speed and escapes. When you heat it up, it gets things a lot faster to it, but you need the heat in order to officially boil it. The phase change is what we're talking about right now. What's happening there? Well, let's talk about the three major states of matter. We have liquid, gas, and solid. So if I go take something from a gas to a liquid, what is that called? Yes. If I take something from liquid to gas, If I take something from liquid to solid. Freezing. 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 Solid to liquid. Melting. Gas to solid. It's not actually, it's called uh, deposition. And solid to gas. It's not evaporation either. These are the two that people usually don't think of. Uh, this is sublimation. Sublimation is something you probably have seen. If you've seen snow on the ground and then as it starts to warm up, it's still kind of cold right there near the ice. Some of it melts, but not all of it melts. Some of it, the, some of the solid goes straight into the water vapor before it melts. And that, so you see sublimation there. There's an internet video where somebody was trying to convince the audience that snow is some strange chemical now. It's not really snow anymore. It's somebody's trying to kill us. And he took a blowtorch to it and there wasn't much liquid behind 